ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲಂ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನಾಂ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಬಾಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಾಸಿ ಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಹೋಪ್ ಯು ಬಿನ್ ಫೈಂಡಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ ಸೋ ಫಾರ್ ಬೋತ್ ಇನ್ಫರ್ಮೇಟಿವ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯೂಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಇನ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ತ್ರೀ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ಸ್ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ವರ್ಡ್ ಸಜೆಸ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ಕಾಮನ್ಲಿ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಪೆನ್ಸ್ today we will see the first of them which is ushtrasan for all back extension it's important that the back or the spine is well worked and the concave back position that we've mentioned in all the episodes so far is well established one must imagine that the concave back position is so much enhanced that the spine naturally moves into a back bend for this the spine must be well prepared so every single one of the previous episodes are required and should be well practiced for this upcoming segment it is for this reason that we have positioned the sex the section on back extensions at this face so that the previous episodes are well understood and well practiced we will see today's asana which is ushtrasan or a camel's pose just like the camel has a hump the profile of the pose resembles a camel always remember in back bends one must never collapse or drop the spine or compress the lumbar to simply fall back into a back bend as the word suggests it must be an alert extension of the spine the spine must be firm and well erected well extended in which way we approach a back bend the spine should not collapse or should not compress keeping this in mind we will proceed to see how one must do ushtrasan we will now take you through the instructions for ushtrasan first we start by sitting in virasan Virasan is a sitting pose that was discussed in the earlier sections. So, sitting in Virasan here with the knees as well as the feet shin together. In this pose when you're sitting, you'll have to make sure it is the buttock bone that makes contact with the heel bone. I'll clarify that for you. The buttock bone in order to make contact with the heel bone, the back thigh should be long, sharp then it exposes the buttock bone to the heel bone but if the buttock tucks in then it only slouches or exits the sacrum then what comes in contact with the heel bone is the thick fleshy part of the buttock and not the buttock bone so you have to move the thigh back and sit in such a way that the sharp part of the buttock bone comes in contact with the heel bone move the thigh back and make sure the sharp part of the buttock bone comes in contact with the heel bone now there is the body of the thigh the thigh the quadricep is a thick muscle you have to willfully descend the weight of the thigh onto the shin usually the front of the ankle front metatarsal and the lower shin struggle to make contact with the ground on its own and so you have to use the weight of the thigh to hammer into that part of the shin to get that contact of the shin with the ground that is the first position to establish for ushtrasan where there is solid contact between the shin and the ground from that position the practitioner will then raise up to a kneeling position where though the buttocks are coming up you still willfully plug the metatarsal front the lower shin as well as the frontal ankle down to the ground 
you see this gap that comes in here that should be avoided the entire section of the shin frontal metatarsal should be pressed down to the ground while coming up this is the second phase usually when you come up if you allow the metatarsal to come up or the frontal ankle to come up then the weight comes over the knee exclusively in order to avoid that you have to paste the metatarsal frontal shin down and then come up so that as you can see here there is no space between the shin and the ground this puts the weight on the shin and not on the fragile part of the knee keeping that in the second position you take your hands up on the buttock and then really pull the middle buttock forward by middle buttock i mean the area of the buttock has a top section has a bottom section and has a middle section and that's the fleshy part of the buttock that part of the buttock the fleshy part of the buttock must be drawn in to make sure the sacrum and tailbone engage in this action during that part the chest should not shrink raising the chest up raising the wall of the abdomen up rolling the shoulder back spreading the chest from center to side you have to make the area of the chest expansive while the chest is expansive you have to continue to move the middle buttock forward the thigh has to yield to allow the middle buttock to come forward sharp raise at the sides of the body the armpit should not dig back you have to move the armpit back to front upward you have to hook the armpit if you see the spine at the back is injected forward upon which the chest is raised up this gives a coiling action so the chest has to be coiled back ribs in chest up back ribs in chest up with that coiling action the hand has to be released down far away from the body in such a way that the shoulder blades are contracted lifted and then the hand is released to the heel here pressing the palm on the heel the practitioner then has to mobilize the armpit forward mobilize the chest upward raise the sternum and really draw the hips forward this is the final position where the anterior neck is also extended pressing the palm raising the chest up as if you really plucking and coming up with the chest you have to release the hand from the heel and then sit back in virasan the classical pose that we just showed now had the knee as well as the shin feet together what happens is for beginner practitioners is that when you have the knees and shin together it creates a difficult entrance for the spine that is because everything is tightly knit the paraspinal muscles as well as the spinal muscles don't have the fluidity or freedom with which they can enter so some practitioners may find it hard or strenuous to descend the hand down in which case you can start from this virasan which we've also showed in the virasan or sitting section where the buttock is placed between the heels here the it is the inner shin bone that touches the ground so the practitioner before starting must place their palms over the sides of the foot so that while rolling spreading the feet and touching the sides of the feet down to the ground i'll show you what i mean initially it's possible that the inner shin touches the ground so the practitioner then has to place the heel of the palm on the outer side of the foot spread the foot out spread the foot out and press the outer foot down to the ground you have to spread the foot and this distributes the weight also on the outer side of the shin so the entirety of the shin gets pressed to the ground again not forgetting to really press the quadricep down and add weight to the shin you have to press the quadricep press the shin bone down and yet come up with your buttock 
Now when you come up with your buttock, because of the spacing between the legs, there is also a space that is available between your knee and this space gives the freedom of movement for the paraspinal and spinal muscles to move. Once again, keeping the space as if injecting the spine through that space, the buttock middle has to come forward, the sacrum tailbone has to come forward. A word of caution, whenever the taking the thigh forward, you must never be tempted to shrink the chest. The chest has to be robust and up. Never sink or let the spine fall. The chest has to be prominently up, gripped well, while the middle buttock comes forward, then spreading the chest, rolling the shoulders back, like shown in the previous segment, you then release your hand down to the heel where the hand extends far back first. Against that, the chest and armpit has to raise up. So the arm is in no hurry to go to the foot. First, the middle, the chest and the armpit has to raise up. With that, the hand then searches for the foot, gets placed on the foot entirely. Pressing the palm down, making sure the foot and shin get contact. You have to pull the middle buttock forward, pull the ribs up, coil the chest upward, raise the sternum up, give the anterior throat the necessary extension. Then as if it is the chest that was lifting up, you have to come up with the chest, releasing the hand simultaneously. Then you sit back in Virasan. So we mentioned the first scenario where sometimes when the, you're unable to hold the shin down, the legs or the feet come sliding inwards for that. And this is also beneficial, the arrangement that I'm going to show, for people who are not able to completely sit on the ground, they don't have the mobility of the knee to be able to sit on the ground, then you use the current arrangement that I'm so, uh, showing. It duly serves both purposes, feet sliding in and inability to sit down. Here then you use a block that is placed between the inner ankles. So the block is placed between the inner ankles. Then keeping the block between the inner ankles, the practitioner comes up. Because the buttock is now seated on a higher plane, the range of movement is not as, as difficult for the knee for it to be taken all the way down. Of course, if you need, you can keep two blocks, you can keep a vertical bolster, you can keep the block turned around depending on how much height is required until which a practitioner can go down for sitting in Virasan. Here I am showing you with the block flat and the block is held in between the inner ankles. After doing that, I am keeping two blocks on either side of the feet. As you know, essentially for Ushtrasan, the practitioner reclines, raising the chest up and then places the hand on the feet. But in cases where you're not able to do that, remember I said sometimes people fall, collapse the spine. It is not about taking your hand all the way towards your foot at the initial first shot itself. Rather, it's about how the spine can be kept tall and firm with the diaphragm and the chest expanded, armpits alert back to front. That positioning is more important. So if you are not able to take the hand to the foot with that spinal position, then it's okay to keep height, but take the armpit, raise the spine, raise the chest and come down such that your hands can be placed on the block. Here, as you see, if, you're, if you have to drop your spine to take your hand towards the feet, you may as well not do that. You place the hand on height, drive the back ribs in, contract the shoulder blades, fix it in and then raise the chest up, making sure that the middle buttock is sharp and forward. So this lifts you a little off the ground and also gives the spine the necessary elevation. Pressing your hand, you come up. Sit back down on Virasan. So now I'll show how we can use the rope to release or relieve this fall. As you can see, when the practitioner goes down here, sometimes this is the way they go. The buttocks go back and the chest is sunk. There is an absolute sinking of the chest here. 
here when I will use a rope around the armpit and make sure I'm able to lift the armpit chest in a way that I'm able to bring the buttock forward and raise the chest up. Here, when I lift the armpits up, I'm able to raise the sternum and then the practitioner can roll the shoulder back, press the palm on the brick and further lift the chest up. In this way, we can assist people who are unable to mobilize their spine as well. Releasing and going down to Virasana. Here we are using a blanket. Sometimes people find the soft surface of a blanket more comfortable, less painful to place uh, the knee on and work for prolonged periods. So we're here we are using a blanket. Now, sometimes for some practitioners as seen here, it's possible that the shin or the front ankle doesn't touch the floor. For Ushtrasan, it is mandatory that the length of the shin touches the floor. So here, when the practitioner comes up, they lay weight or push the shin down as they come up. But then, here we place a bolster across over the heel as well as the shin. Now, as you can see, this is just the weight of a bolster. You may use additional weight like a plate weight on top of it so that that weight can give further, add further kilos to push the shin down. So, this is just the bolster but we can also top it, up, top it up with more weight. Here, the practitioner then sits down, sits down back, and when, they sit, and when they sit down here, as you can see, this bolster gives additional press to the shin. So with that additional press, as you can see now, there is no gap between the shin and the ground that was there earlier. So in this manner, adding additional weight Make sure that the weight is not too much. Here we are just using a bolster. You have to study under an instructor to understand what these prop arrangements are. But this is just to give an idea as to how props work. This is a mild weight that already works on her shin. So pressing down on that, taking the weight of the bolster, the practitioner then comes up and proceeds to Ushtrasana. So while the practitioner proceeds to Ushtrasan, there is the weight of the bolster that holds the shin down or gives the shin a sense of direction and then the hand needn't be released all the way towards the heel so that the spine doesn't need to collapse. Taking the height of the bolster, the spine can be kept up and open. In this manner, a bolster can also serve as a very effective prop. In cases where the spine lacks mobility, we can now use a rope wall as we are going to show. So, this is a rope wall and the practitioner is already sitting in Virasan and between the front of the knee and the wall, we've placed a pillow. This pillow is not a tall, high pillow. We call it the pranayam pillow. It comes just about above the knee when a person is seated. So, with this, we will show you how to proceed. Pressing the shin down, the practitioner comes up. After coming up, as I told you, this pranayam pillow is just above the knee, comes around the area of the middle thigh. So then, holding the ropes, we mentioned earlier that the buttock should be taken forward, the middle fleshy part of the buttock, tailbone sacrum must be taken forward. So this pillow, provides that mobility to really take that buttock towards the wall. So here the middle thigh, the lower thigh is kept back. The top thigh which holds the buttock has an advantage to go forward. With that, holding the ropes, you will have to suck the back ribs in and really raise the sternum up, expanding the chest. Then you will have to slowly arch back but holding the rope provides that fulcrum to lift rather than drop into a curve. So holding the rope, you'll have to pump the chest up, pump the sternum up, draw the back ribs in, 
coil the chest and go down slowly releasing the elbow while at the same time trying to maintain the hip forward then you come back up lifting the chest this we showed you with the movements broken but to mobilize it you do these actions relatively quickly in a cycle a few times continuously as he will show holding the rope lifting the chest up taking the middle buttock in you lift the chest go back come up through the chest and up once again taking the middle buttock in lift the chest go back releasing the hand straight and then you come back up this when you do it a few times it gives them the mobility to go back with the spine but at the same time keep the spine lifted this when we do it in fast cycles it gives the spine fluidity as well now we have showcased many variations of ushtrasan as you see the prop arrangement for everything is different depending on the condition on and the principle towards which we are working this is for opening the diaphragm and increasing the lung capacity as you will see it's not easy to hold a back bend for long but the only way the capacity of something can increase is if you hold the position in an expanded but passive way so that it is long enough to effectuate a concrete change this version of ushtrasan is one of those as you can see we have a bench a stool which we call the halasan bench which is topped with a bolster and then a blanket i use this height so that this height is in line with the person's buttock and sacrum behind there is a chair again with an elevation of a pillow and then a blanket so that when the person rolls back they have a support for the head and neck to rest on there is a gap between the two and we'll show you why so keeping the sacrum or buttock rested against the bolster the practitioner then places the palm raises the chest up there is no back bend or any pose that can be done with a sunken spine or chest so the chest has to be raised and the shoulder has to be mobilized backward with that the practitioner has to slowly recline on this arrangement in such a way that the shoulder comes into the gap between the bolster that is the stool and the chair at this point then the practitioner releases the hand head rested pressing the shoulder down in such a way that the chest and diaphragm remain lifted then the practitioner bends the arm and holds the front of the box this gives a grip to further raise the chest up but the entire support system allows for a person to stay in the pose this staying helps widen the chest expand the lung capacity widen the diaphragm while at the same time delivering all the benefits of ushtrasan so this is a variation how poses or asanas can be modified according to the needs of an individual We now saw the classical pose ushtrasan as well as prop assisted variations. We saw various prop arrangements where a block was used between the feet, bricks were used for the hand, bolster was used on the shins and for the hand, a rope wall was used as well as the fully supported variation in ushtrasan. Each one of these variations have several benefits. Ushtrasan itself opens the dorsal or chest area deeply and provides good diaphragmatic extension and therefore the lung and the breathing capacity increases also abdominal cramps are released in the restive variation because the hands press against the feet the metatarsals are used it raises or strengthens the wrist as well as the ankles and the shin since the tailbone is deeply engaged problems with the pelvis catches or back catches are also released ushtrasan in the restive variation is a particular example of how a back bend can be sustained for a prolonged period of time in a way cognizant changes can be effected 
When a person lies back in Ustrasan as shown in the stool arrangement, there is time for the diaphragm to release, time for the air sacs to release, time for the entire lung to open and experience proper breathing. In this manner, Ustrasan serves several benefits. In the upcoming section, we will see more back bends. In the meantime, happy practicing. Mm -hmm.